we wanted to, to find uh, leaders who have been leading for a long time, just like some of you who have been leaders in our union for a very long time, who often feel like you're alone. And we wanted you to be able to hear stories of leadership from folks who've walked a very similar path, who've made a, a commitment to their own mission and purpose, and for you to hear some of what the challenges that they face, the stories uh, and obstacles that they've overcome, and what really brings them to leadership. So I've been asked to, as I'm moderating this panel, <laughs> uh, to <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of them to, off, to answer the same question. So we're going to ask them three questions. We're going to allow them each to answer. We'll start uh, the first question with Executive Vice, Vice President Valerie Long. Uh, Valerie, the first question that our members uh, want to hear from you about is, at what point in your life did you decide and realize that you were a leader? And what does your leadership and that moment look like? Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, let me say that I am still struggling with that challenge because every day, like um, Secretary Treasurer Kimmy Bond said, I have doubts about my leadership because our tasks are great and collectively we have a lot to do. So every day, I am challenged by, am I doing the right things? Am I making the right choices? Am I good enough? But having said that, it's hard to talk about leadership without talking about people in this room and the people that inspire me. I am fortunate to be in rooms like this and be inspired by leadership that I've felt today. And those make those choices that I make even more um, poignant and relevant. So my journey to leadership started with a realization that people were going to continue to push me out on a limb and saw that monkey off. And I would kind of look and say, oh, I got to do this. <laughs> example and example after example of people having more faith in me than I had in myself. And after a while, it gets a little bit more comfortable. There would be times when I would come up on stages like this and I would be shaking, I'm shaking a little bit, but not that bad, or I'd be getting ready to cry or something. It becomes easier, and I think leadership is something like that. You wear it for a while, you get comfortable in it, and you keep on challenging yourself and keep on doing it. So I can't speak to the exact time, the exact date, or the exact place, because I still think I'm struggling with being a leader every day. Thanks for... Thanks, Val, for, for a very honest answer. Um, you know, we in ULTCW really start from a place of humility and, and admitting our own faults and mistakes and, and aspiring to be better, so we really appreciate your honest response. Senator Padilla. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, too, don't know exactly kind of when, you know, what day, what time, what, what the circumstances were. I, uh, I was blessed to be brought up just hearing about a lot of uh, good advice. You know, when you're a, a young person, you hear a lot about, well, you want to do well in school because you're going to be the leader of tomorrow. You know, when you're in elementary school, you hear that. When you're in junior high, I heard that. When I was in high school, I would hear that. I grew up playing baseball, and I would hear it from my coaches. Uh, my parents were always pushing me to get a good education and, you know, sort of lead by example. The good things do come out of communities like Pacoima in the East San Fernando Valley. And so I was always just, um, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and, and so when I was growing up, I was just always thinking, okay, well, I better, I better do good in school. I need to learn. I need to take notes. I need to remember all this advice because maybe someday I could be a leader. Uh, it wasn't something I was working towards. It wasn't something I was aiming for. I was just trying to get a good education and a good job and trying to help take care of my family. And as LaFonta said, I graduated with an engineering degree. Uh, many times I feel like the Forrest Gump of politics because I was in the right place at the right time and I got involved in a political campaign. 
And it was a long shot campaign in 1996 for, for Tony Cardenas, who's now in Congress, but we won. And then in 1997, it was a different campaign. In 1998, it was a different campaign. And in 1999, there was a vacancy on the Los Angeles City Council. And the same reason I had gotten involved with a couple of the other campaigns is because living in the East San Fernando Valley, the whole history politically that I knew was that when there was an opening for city council or for Congress or anything in between, somebody was moving into our community to run for that office. Somebody was moving into the area with money or political connections to represent us. And so the people I was helping get elected were people born and raised in the East San Fernando Valley who knew what it was like to live there and to struggle there. They had a, a family commitment to the community. And so in 1999, there was the question of who was going to run for the 7th Council District. And I never imagined I would run for office. You know, I never imagined I'd be in politics, but you know, I was happy that I was. And I was thinking, who am I going to help next? I helped so-and-so, I helped so-and-so. Who am I going to help next? And people started talking to me about, Alex, it's your turn. You need to step up and be a leader for the community. And think about it. I was 25 years old at the time. 25 years old. I turned 26 just before the election. And I thought, well, a lot of people are going to say that I'm too young. But guess what? I was watching the same thing happen. People moving into my community to run for that city council seat. And I, I, after a lot of reflection and prayer, I felt the calling. You know, I may not have been an expert on the city budget. I, I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm not an expert on municipal law. But I know what it's like to live in my community. I know what my community, what my neighbors need. I can learn the city budget. I can learn how to pass an ordinance, but you can't learn what it's like to, to, to have lived in my community and struggled in my community. And so I felt the calling. And uh, and, and, and that was about 15 years ago. Uh, but still wonder to this day, is there somebody else that's better prepared? Is there somebody else that's more ready? Uh, but when the opportunity is there, uh, and you have a chance to step up. Sometimes you're looking for it. Sometimes it's looking for you. you. Senator Mitchell? Uh, like Senator Padilla said, I believe leadership is a calling. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I always trust people who kind of self-identify. I am your leader. Um, <laughs> But I believe true leaders um, who make a difference um, in lives on issues are called to that. And uh, I, I don't have a moment in time where I said, you know, I think I'm a leader. <laughs> I do have a moment in time when I realized that I was an activist. And out of my activist experience around issues, I began to see vacuums in leadership and because I was called to be an activist on issues that were important to me, step by step, little by little, organization by organization, I found myself in a leadership role, but it was because of my core belief and sense of activism. I think sometimes people misunderstand what true leadership looks like and what leaders look like, and we always assume it's the person who self-identifies, the one who volunteers to be the captain, the one who volunteers. And I don't know that we give enough time or thought or credence to the notion of preparing to be a leader. You know, leadership is a discipline that requires study and thought and practice. And so once I found myself in a leadership role, particularly when I was at Crystal Stairs, because that was leading an organization of 500 employees, with tens of thousands of contract child care providers that I was responsible for. So that required that I exercise <laughs> my leadership muscles in a different, more meaningful way. Anything we want to build and make stronger, we exercise. We have to exercise our brain. We have to exercise to make our muscles stronger. Well, leadership is the same thing. 
And so it required that I treat it like a discipline and study the art of leadership to, to give myself tools and resources to draw upon when leadership opportunities presented themselves. And so I don't think we should think about leadership as kind of innate. Oh, they're a natural leader. Well, you might have natural leadership tendencies, but when the rubber meets the road and you're in an organization where you're facing a crisis or you're leading an organization of hundreds of thousands and you have to make critical decisions, you have to be in a place where you understand all the people all the time aren't going to like me. <laughs> but that's not the goal. The goal is to make the best decision on behalf of whatever the cause is. And so while I don't remember waking up thinking, I'm going to be a leader today, I do remember growing and maturing in my activist life experience. And based on that, recognizing when offered the opportunity, when it was a time to come for me to step up in leadership and what work I would have to do then and on an ongoing basis to study, look at styles of leadership, and then begin to shape and fashion my own. I definitely, I definitely feel like we have put together a very valuable panel here just from that first round of, of answers. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I like to do is also study leadership. And these are three people who I have studied. They may not know it. Uh, I, uh, as I said to you guys, Valerie uh, was my boss. What Valerie taught me um, as uh, when I was working for her was that no matter the challenge, no matter the challenge, meet it with your heart. There is no more caring person in SCIU that I have worked with than Valerie Long. When I first met Senator Padilla, I had just arrived into Los Angeles, and some of you might remember a staff person who used to work here by the name of Nicole Ward. Nicole took me to meet <coughs> Senator Padilla as someone that I should know as I began to step into my service to all of the members of ULTCW. And I went to Senator Padilla's office in the San Fernando Valley, which I had no idea what it was at the time. Uh, and Senator Padilla taught me, and he may not know this, but Senator Padilla taught me that you always prepare for not just the thing that you're trying to accomplish, but the three things that might happen on the way to accomplishing it. Uh, and, and I have taken that lesson in my engagements uh, on, uh, the, on behalf of our members, but also in my, in my own life. State Senator Holly Mitchell. <laughs> State Senator Holly Mitchell and I met for the first time in Harold and Bells. Uh, she was running for uh, assembly, and she was running against an SEIU member. And SEIU had funded um, a campaign to support the member that was running. And because I was new to California and new to Los Angeles, I thought I'd give State Senator Holly Mitchell a shot. I'd listen to what she had to say. And in a lunch meeting that was supposed to be scheduled for an hour, three hours later, I knew that State Senator Holly Mitchell, no matter what position she was elected to serve, I knew that our, she would represent the interests of our members and working families, and she would do it with the fervor and passion that all of you bring to the care that you provide for your clients. So each of them have taught me lessons along our journey and along my own journey, and I'm grateful to each of them uh, for all of those lessons. So the next question, and we'll start with you, Senator Mitchell. The next question is, if you had one piece of advice, if you had one piece of advice to give to our member leaders, some of whom have been leading for 
20 years, some of whom have been leading for two months. If you had one piece of advice to give them on leadership, what would that advice be? Great question. <clears throat> I don't think any of us are looking for leaders who know everything. <clears throat> Nobody here knows everything because I don't see my 13-year-old here or my mother. Those are the only two people in the world who know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so since they're not here, the rest of us don't know everything, just those two. <clears throat> and so leaders who feel like I have to have all the answers and be right, I think are missing the boat. So the piece of advice I would give you in your leadership journey, because it's a journey, it's a process. You're not going to arrive there one day and be a leader and stop your learning. <clears throat> is have the confidence to know what you know and have the confidence to go get help, expert counsel, and direction when you don't know. Mm. There's nothing uh, wrong with that. When I led Crystal Stairs, I was clear about my overarching role and responsibility. And so I understood the three areas where I needed to make sure that I was on it. The area of finance and my general counsel to protect the integrity of the organization so we could do our work. So I went and got the best in the field to provide me with that technical expertise. And I would say, tell me what I need to know. And I would say, say that again. Use different words. <laughs> Whatever we have to do so I can internalize it and understand it. But I also have the confidence to know that my role as the leader is up here, and I'm going to hire support and smart people to, to funnel channel information to me. I think the mistake leaders make is to assume that because you've elected me or hired me as your leader, you expect me to know it all. No, I expect you to be smart enough and have enough integrity and self-confidence to assemble a team around you to create the leadership team that any organization needs. Senator Fadia, what some got some advice for us? Yeah. No, that's that's a great start because as you're talking, I realize that's how I hire people. Absolutely. You know, when I'm hiring people to work in my district office or in the state capitol, uh, I'm not looking for people with master degrees or PhDs or people that went to the best schools. That doesn't hurt, but you don't want people who think they know it all. You just want people who have the, the, the creativity to go find the answer. You, know, you don't need to have the answer, I just need you to know how to get the answer. Um, you know, when I think about leadership, uh, which is different than thinking about leaders, uh, I think two kind of fundamental things over and over again, and they, and they change over time. One is to ask yourself, what are we trying to lead on? Or what are we trying to lead for? Because that could be different from you know, year to year, month to month, week to week, day to day. And second, that's so, so critical, uh, and Senator Mitchell touched on it, communication. Because a good leader can have it in their mind, we gotta do this. But if you can't explain it, if you can't articulate it to the other people understand, you know, you're not gonna be that effective. But it starts with being clear in your mind what are we leading on? Uh, and it can be different, like I said, as, as time goes on. And just, let's just take this gathering here today. What are we leading on? Is it because we, it's an election year, we gotta go elect some people, and we gotta lead on political organizing? Or are we leading to increase wages and benefits for our members? Are we leading on trying to sign as many people up before we, the Supreme Court may do what it's gonna do? Are we leading on just a greater message uh, and movement about inequality in America? There's a lot to lead on. And I may be good at one piece of it, and Holly Mitchell may be good on another piece of it, and you all may be better on another piece of it. So we're all leaders. 
we're all gonna have to work together. We gotta be clear when we're leading that specific conversation, what are we leading on, what are we leading for, and try and try to get it right so we can communicate to others. Because once that's clear, then we can lay out a specific plan of how to get there. But you gotta have the vision for it, and then you gotta be able to communicate it. I 100% agree with both of those. Um, to, to build on it, my one piece of advice is that you really have to figure out what you're drawing your strength from, right? Because as both of them said in different ways, it's not about the one person, it's about the collective. And what you're building here is a team of leaders, but it can be lonely when you leave this room and you leave all this energy and you go back to the battles, the individual battles, figure out how to continue to draw strength from each other and your sense of purpose. We talked a lot about our unity, our leadership standards talks about unity as the first leadership standard, but you can't be unified if you don't have that sustenance. And I believe that there's a way in which we need to draw the sustenance from each other, from our strategic partners, and from our higher power, whatever you may call him or her. I think it's very important to have that spiritualness, that purposefulness, and that way that we sustain each other in this movement. to the last response, something else occurred to me <clears throat> when you talked about loneliness. <laughs> and it occurred to me because Ms. Butler has served in this role for me, <clears throat> is to have someone in your life who you are willing to give <clears throat> permission to be completely honest with you. <laughs> and sometimes it's better if they're outside of your organization because then you don't get involved in the you know, because if you're the leader of the, of the work group, whatever, sometimes it's easier if, you, easier if you find someone outside of your organization who you give permission to tell you like a T.I. is, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and when you've identified that person and the first time they do it, you can't get an attitude. You did not, Ms. Mitchell. Because you've asked for it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you recognize that it's coming from a place and from someone who has your best interest at heart. Because let's, let, let's be clear, when you're a leader, sometimes you're the target. And all arrows point toward the leader. Everybody thinks they could have done the job a little bit better than you. And so that's what makes it lonely. And so find someone who you are willing, who you trust, you, you trust their integrity, and trust their ability to be honest and direct, to tell you like it is, you have to be open to receive it and decide if that's a change or an action that you're willing to take. But find someone that you make that pact and agreement with to provide you that kind of support. Thanks, thanks, Ms. Mitchell, for, for coming back to that. And, and I, am, I appreciate that permission. I really appreciate that permission. Um, the next question, and then I'm going to uh, actually, uh, I'm going to ask this one question, let them uh, respond, and then I'm going to give them all an opportunity to close and sort of say whatever it is that they want to say. Um, Valerie, you talked about um, from finding the place from where you draw your strength. And I've said to uh, Kim, who is my sort of right hand, and everybody uh, knows it's where a place where I find uh, support, I've said to her a number of times, you know, this job is probably the loneliest job I've ever had. Mm -hmm. As much as I am surrounded constantly by noise, by conversation, by gratitude, by thankfulness, uh, by sorrow, by voices who love and care for me dearly. Uh, it is lonely when you have to make a decision that impacts 175,000 people and you don't know which way to go. So 
I guess the one question that I would have is if you guys could talk about a little bit where do you draw your strength? Where do you find uh, those sources of support? Who is your support system? Who's your support network? Um, several things. I start from the place of the advice I gave before. I have a very deep spiritual sense, and I do believe that there's a higher power that calls um, us to do the best that we can in the shot that we've got. Um, I care. I care deeply about my great-granddaughter. I care deeply that the work we do are going to is going to impact her. She's 10 years old, and if not for what we do now, she's not got a shot. So I'm moved by that and strengthened by the fact that um, we have a lot of work to do on her behalf. And um, I get support from a lot of folks. I, get support, I, get, I draw a lot of energy from members. I remember I was in Youngstown. Um, in a gathering much smaller than this, about 80 people. Youngstown is a very depressed town in Ohio. It's an old steel town. Steel mill's been gone for a long time. These workers were supporting Nina Turner for Secretary of State there. They were on fire for that sister. And I just like fell in love. And I had gone in pissed off about some latest blow to immigration reform, some something else that pissed me off. I think something around another black man in Florida got killed. I was just in a funk. But having that energy with those workers there really did get me out of that. And I was able to like move forward and just like figure out what the next moves were. You know, I gained strength from now that I've met you. I'm going to be gaining some strength from you. I'm going to find you on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. <laughs> I do believe that our network is important. And I, I draw strength from other people because you just cannot do it by yourself. And I draw a lot of strength from you. I have known you for a lot of years now and am just like so proud. When she was speaking this morning, I was getting ready to cry. I'm like, oh, what am I crying for? She's doing great. But it's because of the poignancy and the power of our leaders that sustains. And um. I'll just close with the other part of the thing that I think is important, the sense of mission. The sense of mission energizes me, right? Because it's not about just waiting for things to happen. Like you all said this morning, you're not waiting for things to happen, you're going after those blessings. That's energizing and that's a positive thing. So all of those are what I do. Thanks. So I, I still get, on, on a daily basis, more than a daily basis, a, a lot of inspiration, motivation from a couple of areas. And, and they're kind of one and the same. One is my family, and the other is the community I grew up in. You know, my family starts with my parents. You know, hearing the, uh, the stories and the advice over and over and over when I was growing up about their upbringing. Uh, LaFonza mentioned they're immigrants from Mexico. They never had a chance really to go to school. You know, they came here, like so many other families, looking for just an, a better opportunity. Uh, my father was a cook for 40 years. My mother cleaned houses, but it was clear that they wanted me to have a better life. And so a lot of, you know, me trying to do good in school, me going to college, and then me going into public service is, you know, I've been blessed and I'm appreciative of the opportunities that I've had, but I see them <coughs> equally as wonderful opportunities for me to serve but also the fulfillment of my parents' dreams. Uh, and whenever I, for a half a second, think about taking it easy, whenever for half a second I may think about, oh, I'm kind of tired, maybe not this time. I know that's important, that's a challenge. I'll leave that for somebody else. I think about my parents and what I owe to them for what they did to provide for me. Uh, and that's you know, translated to now, you know, my peers, and, and now to my own children, because when they grow up, my, my kids are six and one right now, but when they're 18, 20, 25, 30, I want them to look at my track record, my legacy, not just what's been in the paper, what's been in, in, in politics, but just as a human being, and say they were proud of me, mm -hmm. right? So, so to me, that's kind of pressure. The, uh, the other, The other has to do with the community I, I was raised in. You know, I, I heard some, hearing, some cheering sections that I mentioned Pacoima earlier, and if you, you don't 
that haven't lived in Pacoima, at least you're familiar with Pacoima. You know, I was just telling this story last weekend. My eyes opened to social inequality when I was in high school. I grew up playing baseball, I was playing for the team, and as we would be on that bus traveling from Pacoima to the West San Fernando Valley, from Pacoima to the west side of LA or to Ventura County or to other places, that's when I started seeing with my own eyes, hey, wait a minute, why are these schools bigger, newer, and cleaner than where I'm from? Why are the houses over here and the cars in the driveway looking like this? Because where I'm from, it's different. That's when I knew there was inequity in, in society. And I, and I committed to myself to whatever I did career-wise to doing something about that. Uh, and it just so happens I get a full-time job to try to do that. But you know, that's why when I graduated from college, it would have been easy for me to move somewhere else and achieve a better life. But I chose to come home because if I can work towards a better life for where I live now, everybody benefits, not just me by having moved somewhere else. So for the, uh, so, uh, so I mentioned my family, from my parents to, to my children. It's not just my children, it's every kid growing up in the East San Fernando Valley. If life is better for them, because of a few things I've done along the way, that for me, that's fulfilling. So. <clears throat> I like to uh, collect and read quotes um, from, from other people who've you know, walked before me. And so you know, my, I've got a quote of Dr. King that hangs in my Capitol office. Uh, framed and in my uh, district office in Los Angeles. Um, you know, Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman who ran for president in 1972, her campaign slogan was unbought and unbossed. I love that. Uh, you've heard about Fannie Lou Hamer, the woman who organized the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and, and her famous line is, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, and you've heard Harriet Tubman, you know, the famous, the first emancipator who said, I would have been able to lead more people to freedom if they knew that they were enslaved. And so I love to collect quotes and I have a bulletin board <clears throat> because, you know, I draw from that kind of vision and inspiration and strength. I think what motivates me, you know, unfortunately, you know, I've just got to the Senate, and I've just been there, and I don't have a real sense of community yet in the Senate. I think it's kind of odd, thank you. <laughs> and I think it's because, you know, I don't have the sense of kind of isolation that Ms. Butler talked about, because there is 120 of us in the legislature. But because I won in a special election, and I kind of came in by myself, it's very different than my experience in the assembly when I was elected in a class and we came in as a class and we identified as the freshman class and we kind of supported each other. So I, I have this kind of sense of isolation, so I'm gonna to have to kind of create that sense of community. But what has motivated me from day one when I got to the legislature are the same people and issues that motivated me to give up my very comfortable life leaving Crystal Stairs <laughs> to you know, have to go to endorsement meetings and get put down by Michelle and other people like Michelle <laughs> and, and take a pay cut and give up my pension, all the things I did to run for office. It's because of when, when I was chair of Budget Sub 1 in Health and Human Services and the people who would come and tell me their stories. The mother who came and testified on my bill on human trafficking and education committee on Thursday who talked about, who told a very atypical kind of Ozzie and Harriet story. They live in Stockton. The daughter was in community college, got her first boyfriend, and how before her very eyes, this boyfriend became a predator and the daughter was a victim of human trafficking. You all, when you would come to me and the people you care for in sub one and say, you're cutting my hours, I'm on a ventilator. What four hours out of the day would you suggest I not have someone here to monitor my ventilator? <laughs> and the mothers <clears throat> of adult children with developmental disabilities who said for the first time in his or her life, 
they're happy, I can see it, they want to live independently, and my husband and I don't live in fear every day about what will happen to our adult child with developmental disabilities when we die. Those stories, you know how things just kind of permeate your very being? I will never forget those stories. Those stories have impact on me every day as an elected leader and will have every, an impact on me every day in whatever capacity I'm in. I have a box in the Capitol office of notes that little kids have written me when we were doing our fight, our battle for child care funding, who talked about what going to that preschool meant and the friends they made and their teacher and the things they learned. And the person, the child care provider who gave it to me called it and wrote on the top, Box of Dreams. <clears throat> and I would bring the Box of Dreams with me to Sub One meetings to remind me and the Department of Finance and everybody there that we were there making life and death decisions. So my box of dreams, Shirley Chisholm saying in 1972, as a black woman, she was unbought and unbossed. Uh, all of you and, and, and members of the public who take the time to come to Sacramento and tell your personal stories and educate us about how the decisions we make impact your lives, that's what I draw from and what motivates me to go back into my non-community, <laughs> the Senate, <laughs> <laughs> and do what I try to do on behalf of the people who voted for me. That's my motivation. So as, so as all of us are uh, continuing to work uh, to identify our mission and sharpen our, our purpose and uh, really hone in on our motivation, I thought it would be great for you to hear from these three leaders, uh, not just because they're wonderful human beings, but in their own way, each of them are doing things on your behalf that you may not know about. State Senator Holly Mitchell was the first legislator to take a public position against Governor Brown's position to cap hours at 40 hours for home care workers. Her op-ed op was published in the Sacramento Bee. State Senator Alex Padilla has came to me, asked me for a meeting to find out what he could do on behalf of the members of ULTCW. I said to him, I said to him, I said to him, Senator Padilla, our members are really having a tough time understanding why as workers, as workers, they aren't receiving social security deductions so that they could one day retire with some dignity. State Senator Padilla went back uh, to his office in Sacramento, asked uh, the legislative analyst office to actually produce a report for him so that he could find out exactly how we could go about building and, uh, the effort and the energy and the mobilization to actually change the IRS tax code so that the home care workers could one day have social security deductions and retire with security. Executive Vice President Valerie Long, as we have been preparing uh, for what the, the Supreme Court may decide in Harris versus Quinn. I was in Washington, D.C. At, uh, at a vice president's meeting of our national union, 
and telling the incredible stories that you all have shared with me as you've been knocking on doors and, and walking in your communities and building our, building our union and building our movement. And the first person who said, and I said, look, our members are doing great, but they need the support of the National Union. The first person who said to me, uh, not only asked what could she do, but said, I'm going to send all of my California staff to ULTCW was Executive Vice President Valerie Long. And so, and so, brothers and sisters, you know, I wanted to make those points because here's the distinction that I want to make and, what, and the distinction about leadership that I think this panel demonstrates. It's easy to be a politician. It's hard to be a public servant. And, and when you choose, and when you choose the leadership journey of serving others besides yourself, uh, there are challenges, there are obstacles, there are fears. Um, but you choose to, to serve others and you choose to press on in all of those hard times. I want to, I know Senator Mitchell actually has a meeting back in Los Angeles at six o'clock, so I'm gonna close uh, by starting uh, with her and allowing her really just to share her thoughts. Uh, she was here for the labeling exercise and heard a lot of the incredible things that were being shared. So I'm gonna start with Senator Mitchell and allow her to share her closing thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Butler, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share this really incredible experience with you. I talked to you about quotes that I find valuable. I worked uh, for a, a point in time in my career with the National Black Women's Health Project, founded by a brilliant woman by the name of Billy Avery, um, who's been recognized internationally for her vision. And Billy wrote a book called An Altar of Words, and it literally is a, a list of words that she then tells stories about that gives texture and meaning to the words. And so the word I want to close with is activism. Just when does one decide to devote her life to, or some part of her life to activism? I can't recall ever hearing a child say, I want to be an activist when I grow up. What transforms regular hardworking citizens into dedicated, passionate activists? Perhaps it's anger fuming in the blood that makes us resist the injustices hurled at members of the society. Perhaps it's the high standards of excellence that we hold for our society to be better than the best with integrity and respect for everyone. Whatever the cause, we never know when the moment will come that an issue emerges as a burning passion and we commit ourselves to making sure the world knows about our issue. Activists help make the world a better place. Many important changes have been made because something clicked and made a group of people see the picture more clearly, focusing on the vision of what could be and how changes can lead to a better society. We must celebrate our activists. <laughs> because they are trailblazers who are not afraid to speak up, stand up, and challenge the status quo. They do their work today and create a place for volunteers later. Activism leads and inspires change. The activist passion provides a driving force for the rest of us to learn from. So my word that I give all of you today is activism and to figure out how through activism you can weave a pattern of leadership in your own world. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity Thank to go you. laugh. Absolutely. Yep. Senator Padilla, closing remarks. Well, my, uh, 
My closing remarks may be a, a little unorthodox, but I think they're important, and I'm gonna share them because I care about you, and I care about you, and I care about you. Um, for each and every one of you, as a leader, you can't forget to take care of yourself. You have to make sure and, and I take it by the applause that you know that when I say take care of yourself, that doesn't mean being selfish. Uh, it means taking care of yourself. We have to live a balanced life. I'm guilty just like anybody else. There's always more work to do. There's always another meeting to go to. There's always another event. There's always more reading to do, more phone calls to make, more. There's just always more, more, more. But if you don't take care of yourself physically, if you don't take care of yourself spiritually, if you don't take care of yourself and how you fit in with your, with your family, with your spouse, with your children, with your support structure, with your neighbors, in addition to your coworkers, uh, we ain't gonna get very far. And that's not being a leader. Someone who tries to lead and is a hardworking activist and burns out after five years, we're limiting ourselves. But if we continue to have that balance, and it's something I work hard on every single day, uh, we lead best and we can lead for a long time. So please, please, please take care of yourself. Lafonza and I share as a mentor, Bob Moore, um, who is a leader in um, Baltimore, uh, leader of 1199 um, EDC um, at the time, once said to me, why not you? When I said, I'm not the right person for this or that or other, why not you? So why not you? That's what I will leave you with, why not you? Thank you. <laughs> ULTCW, I think, I think um, we started this morning talking about going to get our blessings. Uh, I think three of our blessings came to us in this last hour of conversation. Uh, you know, tomorrow we'll be joined by a different, much younger, sorry, much younger group of leaders <laughs> uh, who, will, who will also share their leadership journey and story. Um, but this last hour has been an incredible blessing. I hope that you took some, some valuable lessons from it. I hope that you got to know these folks a little bit better. Uh, let's thank them uh, for their time and, and energy and 